Hello all, and thanks for joining us today. It's an exciting time here at Miro. We're just coming off our Miro Next keynote where we shared some of our most exciting new developments and launches. As Varun, our head of product, highlighted at the event, Miro continues to create ways to make work engaging and inclusive for the ever-evolving hybrid workspace. I'm Phil Strain, product lead for accessibility and design systems here at Miro, and also your host for today's session. I am truly excited to have the opportunity along with my team to share our vision for accessibility at Miro. We're going to introduce some of the key pillars for creating accessible products and show some of the great progress that our team has made over the last six months. Later on, we'll be joined by Shari Bernhaber, Senior Staff Architect Accessibility at VMware, for a fireside chat about the importance of accessibility and in driving innovation and collaboration, both within and outside teams. So hi, I'd like to introduce some of our accessibility team here at Miro. So I'm Phil, I'm a white male with a dark beard and light hair, use glasses, and I'm currently wearing a light blue shirt. I hold a PhD in human computer interaction, which involved exploring ways to communicate spatial information to blind and visually impaired users using sound. And I've been involved with the accessibility field for over 15 years, having had the privilege of driving accessibility efforts at companies like Google, Apple, and Spotify. I joined Miro six months ago, and I truly believe that involving people with disabilities in the product development life cycle results in products that are better for everyone. Hey, I'm Kai. I'm a white 32 years old non-binary person with short sunshine yellow hair and multiple facial piercings. I started at Miro as an accessibility designer three months ago, and my background is in UX design and research. Accessibility has been traditionally seen as a front-end developer responsibility, but I believe that design skills are critical to create truly inclusive experiences, and I'm happy that in Miro I can have a separate role for that. Hi, I'm Martin, and I'm a white man in my mid-30s. I'm around six feet tall and have short, slightly graying, light brown hair and a light beard. I'm a software engineer and I joined Miro one and a half years ago. And I've been driving multiple accessibility initiatives here. I strongly believe in the power of universal design and strive to build inclusive products that are accessible to everyone. At Miro, we understand the teams include people of different backgrounds, experiences and access needs. So we strive to give everyone an opportunity to collaborate. This means our intentional goal is not to exclude anyone from engaging in the collaborative process. We want people with disabilities to be able to collaborate fully in meetings, both on and offline. We have an ambitious goal to establish Miro as the industry leader in accessibility for the visual collaboration space. So how are we going to achieve this? First of all, we have three principles that will help us build an accessible visual collaboration platform. The first of these is compliance. We recognize that being compliant with key accessibility guidelines is only the first step towards creating an accessible experience. Our goal is to be compliant with the latest published version of W3C's WCAG. But we also want to go way beyond compliance. There's lots of studies that demonstrate that being compliant with accessibility guidelines doesn't necessarily translate to delightful experiences for people with disabilities. And that's why engagement with the disabled community is a core part of our strategy. Nothing about us without us is a key guiding principle that comes from the disability rights movement in the United States. And this also mirrors one of our core company principles, to practice empathy, to gain insight. So how do we meld compliance with a focus on user experience to unlock collaboration for everyone? There's three parts to our process. One, compliance two, sustainability, and three, innovation. I'd like to hand over to Marcin, who will talk about how we set up compliance in our organization. Thanks, Phil. Our goal at Miro is to be compliant with WCAG 2.1, and we'll issue a VIPA to demonstrate it. So let's dig into how we're going about it. First, we arrange accessibility audit to get an overview of the initial state of our code base, we triaged all the issues and immediately started working on the first round of improvements. At the same time, we started working on accessible foundation for our engineers. And in our case, we created the first accessible components and put together a plan to make sure that all components in our design system that our engineers use to build Miro are accessible. We unlocked the screen reader and keyboard navigation for non-Canvas features and added focus states to all common interactive elements. We also partner with external consultants 
To verify our approach and undergo early testing with users and various assistive technologies. After this initial work, we were able to split out the issues identified in the audit among different product teams and start unlocking the actual user flows. Thanks to this approach and by doing many of these steps in parallel, we have already been able to fix around 40% of initially reported issues. And of course, catching up on the accessibility debt is not enough. We also had to make sure that all new features and changes remained accessible. So we needed a way to catch accessibility issues and regressions early on in our development process. As a result, we improved internal tooling and introduced multiple testing strategies to ensure we will stay accessible every release. Lastly, we needed to help our engineers adapt to these new requirements. We rolled out accessibility training, checklists, and guidelines. We're still working on additional materials and initiatives to ensure that writing accessible code at Miro is actually easier than the inaccessible one. This approach of identifying issues early and often allows us to move fast and launch new features that are accessible from the start. That's why accessibility is such a big part in our internal processes here at Miro. And of course, adopting and operating with the accessibility first principle requires changes not only in engineering, but across the entire organization. And now I would like to hand over to Kai Katonina, our accessibility designer, who will talk about accessibility sustainability and walk us through how we think about accessibility from design and user research perspective at Miro. Thanks, Marcin. So while it's important to fix accessibility defects that we have already found in Miro, it is crucial that we do not introduce the new ones as we grow and create new features. We take a shift left approach and put, among others, responsibility on the designers. Firstly, we have created and published an accessibility policies that mandates that we will adhere to the latest published version of Vika going forward. We also adapted our product development life cycle to ensure that we have considered accessibility in every step of the process. And for example, for design, we have developed a two-stage accessibility review process. The first review is on the concept stage, where we look for common accessibility problem areas, as well as identify flows that will require extra attention, training, or expert help. Mm -hmm. The second review is on the development handover stage, where we check whether all accessibility requirements are met and documented. We have developed a checklist to design deliverables like page name, focus and reading order, alt text, and provide a set of Figma components for accessibility annotations. What's most exciting about working on accessibility at Miro is that we just cannot follow guidelines and best practices. Nobody knows yet how exactly a truly inclusive collaborative whiteboard platform should work, and we must research, experiment, and innovate to figure out the best experience for our users. The only way we can be sure we're doing the right thing is to work together with users. At the accessibility team, we have two groups of customers that we focus on. First of all, it's of course people with disabilities themselves. We learn about their experience through individual users' feedbacks that we receive via in-app and email feedback channels and usability tests done in partnership with Fable. And the second group is those who collaborate with people with disabilities, workshop facilitators, presenters, teammates, diversity and inclusion specialists. Our goal at Miro is to become the central of knowledge about inclusive collaboration and necessary accommodations. This is where our corporate and government customers that have a lot of employees with disabilities uh, are our invaluable allies and our primary way to learn and co-design. We're also looking forward for hiring more professionals with disabilities and are committed to making our hiring and onboarding processes accessible as well. With that, I can hand over to Phil. So there's a wide range of disabilities that can impact how people can collaborate. Disabilities can be categorized as either being permanent, temporary or situational. For example, visual disabilities can range from low vision to blindness to color blindness. And people with visual disabilities can rely on screen readers, braille or screen magnification to perceive information. Auditory disabilities range from mild or moderate hearing loss in one or both ears to substantial and uncorrectable hearing loss in both ears. Captions and transcripts can be really beneficial for this group. Cognitive learning and neurological disabilities may affect any part of the nervous system and impact how well people see, hear, speak and understand information. Physical disabilities, sometimes called motor disabilities, include weakness and limitations of muscular control, 
limitations of sensations, joint disorders, pain that impedes movement and missing limbs. We are actively working to innovate on the experience across all of these areas. And here are some of our upcoming initiatives. So for visual disabilities, we were the first to market to launch an experience for screen reader users to read elements on a board. We are actively working on unlocking full, this full screen reader experience. Auditory disabilities, captions are a core piece of functionality as we think about expanding the scope of meetings to include asynchronous meetings. Cognitive learning and neurological disabilities. People with vestibular disorders, over 39 million people in the US, find it difficult to deal with animations. We are therefore excited to announce that we are making a reduced motion setting available that will mirror the system's reduced motion accessibility settings. We are also conducting research into ways of making whiteboard more accessible to those with cognitive difficulties, such as dyslexia and those with attention deficit. For physical disabilities, sometimes called motor disabilities, for many people, using a keyboard is a matter of efficiency, but for others, it might reduce pain or be the only way to interact with digital products. Our goal is to make all of our features accessible via standard keyboard and keyboard-based assistive input devices. And we believe that keyboard accessibility underpins almost all other work and accessibility, which is why it's one of our top priorities right now. There's a lot of work being done by the accessibility team here at Miro, work that is constantly evolving to ensure that we meet our goal of unlocking collaboration for everyone. If you're interested in finding out more information about accessibility at Miro, all the links to the resources referenced throughout this event, please check out miro.com forward slash accessibility. Collaboration with industry partners is a key part of our strategy in creating delightful experiences. And over the last year, we've met lots of accessibility teams across a wide range of companies. One of those companies is VMware, and I'm honored to welcome Sherry Bernhaver to the Farsight Chat to learn more about the importance of accessibility and driving innovation collaboration, both within and outside teams. So welcome, Sherry. Thanks so much for joining us today. So oh, let's thanks start for from the beginning. Me, Phil. So let's start from the beginning, Sherry, um, and tell us a bit about yourself and your background. How did you get started and what motivates your passion for accessibility? Sure. So just a bit of a visual description of myself first. I'm a six foot tall woman um, who wears bifocals. Uh, I use a wheelchair and I have an insulin pump. So um, you might think, uh, OK, that there's somebody who's multiply disabled. Uh, and, you know, multiple underrepresented identities, uh, that must be why she got into accessibility. And in actuality, I got into accessibility uh, because I have a daughter who's deaf. I view my wheelchair as just a mechanism to get around. It's been part of my life since I was five. And um, to me, that's not really a disability. Um, but my daughter, you know, when she doesn't get captions, when she doesn't get things in writing, um, she really is severely disadvantaged. And so um, that ended up how I got into accessibility. It just so happened that I had a good collection of educational experiences to go along with that. So I started off with a degree in computer science. Um, then I went to law school um, and then I got an MBA. So I have this, you know, vast lived experience as a person with a disability, um, but also the educational and business background to kind of see accessibility from all perspectives. Yeah, I think that's really interesting how you mentioned um, like your computer science background. And I think, you know, it's it's one of the pieces as we kind of talk to different teams about accessibility, to be really able to communicate all the different aspects of accessibility from a technical perspective. But I guess it's not technically necessary to have a, a computer science degree in order to no. really focus. No, it's on not necessary at all. But I got to tell you, it's really helpful that if you have a developer that says, oh, something is really hard and it's going to take 12 weeks to do. Um, sometimes my response is, would you like me to code that for you? And uh, that usually gets rid of that objection quite quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I would love to hear more about your, your current role with VMware. What does your day to day look like and what do you enjoy most about your role? Sure. So I was accessibility employee number one at VMware and we now have a team of over 20. Uh, with uh, several re requisitions open, hint, hint, careers.vmware.com, uh, search for accessibility. Uh, so uh, I built uh, the program. 
Uh, and about 18 months in, I've been at VMware for three years now, um, my boss decided that the job was getting too big for one person. And so we actually split it in, in half. So we hired a manager who handles all of the product accessibility uh, pieces, anything that has to do with producing uh, the, the VPATs, the voluntary product accessibility templates, sits on one side of the accessibility team. And then I shifted into an individual contributor role where I focus on accessibility innovation and outreach, which is how I ended up developing the, the relationship with Miro. VMware actually pays me, I spend about 25% of my time working with our vendors to make their products more accessible. Um, and then they're not making them more accessible just for VMware, they're making them more accessible for everyone. Um, and so uh, that's literally the favorite part of my job. Yeah, it's really great to hear about those two pieces because sometimes like the initial focus on accessibility is all about compliance and that is absolutely a really important first step. But to actually kind of take the next step and to really, you know, engage with people with disabilities and learn about how um, people experience your product and how um, you can really improve based on that is really, really exciting. And there's so many opportunities um, for innovation there. And I'd be really interested to hear, is that part of um, VMware's accessibility practice and philosophy? And could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. We, we have personas with disabilities that we use for some of our end-to-end -end storytelling. Uh, we do user research with people with disabilities, specifically focusing on their experience with assistive technology primarily. Um, we do uh, lots of events, like we've got Global Accessibility Awareness Week uh, coming up where some of the events are internal, but some are external. We do um, accessibility hackathons. We'll be doing one that I'm trying to get permission to make public, uh, which would be happening probably in the early November timeframe. So uh, we don't look at accessibility from a risk perspective, um, which is a lot of what a lot of companies do. So small teams combined with the risk perspective means you don't get that rich addition of all of the things beyond compliance that really actually make it not just a compliant experience for people with disabilities, but an excellent experience for people with disabilities. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's so important. And something I've seen, you know, throughout my career is like, it's really important to really engage people because you can absolutely be compliant, but there's lots of research that shows that even if you're compliant, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've created a great experience. And so the two things are really important and to meld together. Yeah. So one, one thing that we have struggled with a little bit at VMware, I'll be honest, is VMware has grown a lot by acquisition. And so in the three years that I've been with VMware, we've acquired 21 different companies. That's fairly well known. It's, I think it's on our wiki page. So um, amalgamating the accessibility experience across all of those, we have 146 products right now, making it so that you know the skip links, for example, um, work the same way on one product as it does on another product is critical because otherwise, as a per, as an individual user transitions from one product to other, if the accessibility experience changes, it's going to be really miserable for the user. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one of the things that we've done at Miro is to look at our design system and accessibility and actually put those two things very close together because we believe it's really important as you're developing a design system to really incorporate accessibility as part of that. And then there is the other step once you have your design system kind of accessible to ensure that it's integrated in a way. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Um, oh, absolutely, 100%. If your design system's not accessible, your end product's not going to be accessible. I mean, that's that's just the way it is. And shockingly, if you look at the, the public database of design systems, uh, 20 plus or minus out of 1,000 uh, have made or advertised that they've made uh, some attempts at making their design system accessible. If you choose one of the other 980, uh, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So what's the most inspiring or challenging project that you're currently working on at VMware? So uh, I would say that the biggest challenge I'm working on um, is related to the question that I just answered about the skip links, for example. We're actually working on a set of corporate guidelines uh, for not just what to do with accessibility, but how to do it. 
And then we're writing a set of machine learning based tests uh, to test those guidelines. Because if you have a 150 pages of narrative, you know, the developers are never going to understand that whole thing. But, but if the developer is able to run some tests at the end of their page and it says, fix these 14 things and you're good, you know, that, that's much more easily uh, going to get you to, to your successful end goal. So, so that's uh, one of the things that I'm working on um, right now that I'm quite excited about. Yeah, that, that is a really interesting area in the field overall, um, especially like around like automated testing. How do we kind of you know, introduce these things? But um, it's also important to be aware that automated testing doesn't you know, kind of capture all kind of issues, but it, it is an important piece. In yeah, so time. that's one of the re reasons we've turned to machine learning. If you look at mm -hmm. most uh, test engines, uh, they test, you know, 30 percent maybe of the WCAG guidelines. So one of the really important WCAG guidelines is any change that's made visually to the screen has to be told to a screen reader user. And so, for example, current things uh, don't really test for that. So how can you test it using machine learning? Well, you can, you can take a screenshot, perform an action, take another screenshot, do an image comparison, and then check uh, what got output to the user. And so you can um, actually build uh, much more uh, comprehensive tests. We're hoping to get um, our internal test suite anyways up to about 50%, 50-50 split. And we are releasing uh, many of our machine learning tests into the open source. It's called Crest, and it's on the VMware GitHub site. Okay, that's good. Yeah, we'll have to have a look out for that then. So let's move on then to uh, talking about making collaboration inclusive and accessible and across an organization. So just uh, if we want to zoom out a little bit, what are some of the things that work well for you when you're building an inclusive and collaborative environment at your company, whether within your team or cross-functionally throughout the organization? So part of it is making sure that the tools that you're using for collaboration are accessible. I mean, that kind of almost goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyways. Um, and part of it is making sure that your interactions are accessible. So for example, we're on Zoom right now. Uh, if you run a Zoom poll, Zoom is accessible, so the Zoom poll is accessible. Uh, if you dropped a Menti Mentimeter link into the chat win window, Mentimeter is not accessible and I wouldn't be able to participate. But if you plan for that in advance, there is a way that you can say, hey, if you can't use Mentimeter, uh, you know, shoot me this uh, private message and I'll be able to put your input in the Mentimeter board. And then if you describe the Mentimeter output on the screen, You've taken a tool that's not accessible and you've made it accessible. So uh, it, it does take a little bit of advanced planning and some thought, but once you've done it, it's it's very easy, re easily repeatable. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's you know really important point to, at the tools that we use within an organization to ensure that they are accessible. And I think one of the very first um, kind of um, questions that we get is like, um, you know, do you have a VPAD? And then that kind of opens up the conversation. So um, I believe personally a VPAD in itself doesn't you know, mean that you have a product that's usable, but it is a very much a, an initial step and it's a conversation opener that you can then use and, and, and build on. So your VPAD is only as good as the testing that went into it. If you don't test with users with disabilities, if you don't run the manual tests, if you don't test every single major workflow, uh, your VPAD is going to be incomplete. And so we, we have a very rigorous uh, mechanism at VMware uh, to make sure that, that our VPADs are comprehensive enough that they do reflect uh, reality for what the users are going to experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I think another thing that we kind of do internally, so we call it, we drink our own champagne in terms of like we use Miro internally. And one of the things recently that we um, got a lot of feedback in is like um, people with vestibular disorders tend to feel a little bit um, sick because of all the motion. And so we explored a, a reduced motion um, mode for Miro. And as we kind of got internal feedback, 
some people um, said, well, this is great. This is kind of much better than the you know, kind of original experience because it feels much faster. And I think there's this kind of idea that by considering um, the needs of people, um, like with a whole diverse spectrum of needs, you can create products that are better for everyone. And I'm wondering if you have any examples from like VMware where like building this inclusive and collaborative environment has led to a better experience or has bolstered innovation um, across the company. Yeah, so so this accessibility slang for what you're describing there is a curb cut, making air mm -hmm. quotes around that word. So curb cuts the dip in the curb that allows somebody like me in a wheelchair to get from one side of the street to the other side of the street without asking for assistance. But who actually uses curb cuts? Well, probably 1% of the users are, are people in wheelchairs, but you've got mothers pushing strollers, you've got bicycles, skateboarders, scooters, people dragging luggage, Amazon delivery uh, folks. So uh, it's something that was designed for people with disabilities, but ended up benefiting everybody. Uh, Siri is another classic example of that on the iPhone. It was, it was designed to help people with disabilities interact with their iPhones more quickly. Um, but most people who use Siri don't have vision loss. Most people who use captions don't have hearing loss. Uh, so um, if you look at design as being um, completely inclusive or universal, so that you're designing for all situations, all socioeconomic categories, all uh, types of experiences that people might be bringing uh, to users as the table, including disabilities, then you're going to make a better experience for everyone. I would say the, a VMware example of that would be uh, that we have a wellness benefit at VMware where we can submit $1,000 worth of receipts a year um, and get reimbursed for things that are related to our wellness. And that's been a, a pandemic benefit that VMware added. And um, we released it, the, the first version of it um, was very complicated to use. It was integrated in Workday, lots of customer support calls, very complicated. Then they um, built a new version in conjunction with the accessibility team. Uh, we did design reviews, so accessibility got involved very, very early. Uh, we made a couple of suggestions, and the day the product was launched, I and somebody who was a screen reader user were able to submit receipts for reimbursement the first day without help. Great, yeah, that's a really, really great example. Uh, thank you for sharing. So one trend that we see at Miro um, is a shift away from being either 100% in office or 100% remote, and this whole movement towards hybrid work. And what are some of the challenges you see from an accessibility and a hybrid perspective? Um, actually, I see it more as advantages than challenges. Um, I had a job about seven years ago uh, that I ended up leaving the job uh, because they wouldn't allow me more than one day uh, at work from home. And all of a sudden the pandemic happens and on a dime in, in a space of 10 days, they had 180,000 people working from home. The one person was an undue burden. Uh, it's a phrase that they use in the U.S., but they could do it. Uh, when they were forced to by the pandemic. So people with disabilities really benefit from being able to work from home. Uh, you know, we have doctor's appointments, we have, uh, you know, difficulties driving. 30% of people with disabilities don't drive. Um, so there's a, there's a transport issue. Public transportation in the U.S., uh, especially in Silicon Valley, is abysmal. There's very difficult ways of getting buses and trains. And then even then during the pandemic, we weren't allowed to take buses and trains. So um, I think work from home is, is a significant advantage to people with disabilities. Now what's happened on that on the flip side is people who did not consider themselves disabled have become disabled by the work from home experience. So maybe they have a slight bit of hearing loss, but with the noise of their children in the background because their children couldn't go to school, uh, plus, uh, you know, not having uh, the ability to be in a room with a person, they might struggle to understand uh, what's going on. And so that's where things like captions uh, become critical because that gives you a second stream uh, of information and your brain can amalgamate what you're seeing and what you're reading in, into one um, 
cohesive uh, conversation. So I would say uh, that for the most part, uh, people with known disabilities work from home has definitely been helpful, uh, but there are these additional uh, disabled uh, things that are coming up uh, that, that people need to acknowledge so that they can get them taken care of. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a really um, you know really great point, and I think that the shift um, towards um, kind of home working was really advantage. But as you said, also did bring its own kind of set of challenges. Where um, we hear from people that they they find it difficult with the disconnect between you know being at home and and then at the end of the day being able to disconnect, and it can bring um, another level of stress. But it's definitely been very advantageous um, for removing a lot of the barriers that are present um, in the workplace. And I wonder, as we go back, you know, to the workplace, um, I wonder what companies can kind of do to really acknowledge and be aware of some of the challenges that people might face and how to overcome those barriers. So more about, you know, physical accessibility. Um, what are some of the best practices? I, I would say that hybrid work is here to stay. I know we have some uh, companies that are trying to force their employees back to work and, you know, the employees aren't having it. And it's an employee's market right now. If somebody, you know, decides they want to leave a company, uh, they'll be gone in three weeks, If especially if they're in the tech field. So uh, I, I think HR departments and executives would be well served to listen to what their employees want. Uh, may, you know, maybe try to measure it objectively using productivity markers. Are we getting as many lines of code from the developers now as we did before? You know, what are ha what's happening to our customer support call log? What's hap load? What's happening uh, with our quality? Um, with delays and releases and things like that. So there are some objective things you can point to uh, for, for some particular categories of employment um, that will tell you whether or not work from home is working or not. Um, but I think the most critical part in going hybrid is making sure that, like you mentioned, your employees who are working from home have enough touch points and get the same level of consideration when things like bonuses are coming around and stock grants are coming around because they're not as seen, and I'm making air quotes around that word, uh, because they're not actually in the office. Uh, they shouldn't be penalized for that, for regardless of the reason that they've decided to stay at home. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's it's important to maintain those um, kind of touch points and, and to make sure that you know, there isn't that, that difference between people that are um, not able to travel to an office or be in an office versus um, those people um, that are working from home. And one of the things, I guess, at, at Miro, one of our kind of, you know, mission statements is to ensure that we give everyone um, an opportunity to collaborate, whether they're like in an office or if they're working from home. And what I'd love to talk about now is a little bit about your experience um, with Miro and, you know, how it enhances the work that you and your team are doing and if there's any features that your team particularly embraces. So we use Miro for, uh, the, the one thing that we use Miro for consistently um, on the design team at v VMware is mind mapping. So we'll, we'll do a lot of um, process build outs. We do a lot of um, brainstorming and, and leaving post-it notes and things like that. Now, I would say a year ago, um, I didn't interact with Miro at all. Um, I'm a keyboard only user and I use magnification and um, because I have glaucoma and that made it very difficult. And so what would happen is I would have to set up a breakout room with another designer and I would say, hey, here's what I want to go in there. And I, you know, I don't agree with this one. So add this post-it note there. Um, and I felt bad because this designer also wanted to leave their own information, but they were kind of stuck having, having to help me out. So um, as the screen reader uh, and keyboard behavior is improved, because keyboard is, is the underlying accessibility requirement for everything. If you don't have keyboard functionality everywhere, nothing will work uh, because all forms of assistive technology rely on keyboard uh, function and being able to simulate keyboard functions. Um, even for things like drag and drop, which are kind of complicated to do from the keyboard, um, but without being able to drag and drop from the keyboard, I can't use Miro. So um, those those are some of the things that I'm looking forward to, um, is um, fully accessible drag and drop 
uh, for example, and I know um, from my uh, native screen reader using uh, coworkers uh, that they're very happy uh, with some of the screen reader advancements uh, that have uh, come along the way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think keyboard and accessibility um, is so important because I think there is, or at least there used to be a perception in the field of accessibility that accessibility is for screen reader users and that's absolutely very important. But there's so many other kind of, you know, users and you know, different types of assistive technologies that are important to support. And keyboard is absolutely one of the most critical pieces. Um, of that, and I actually think it is the most critical piece. So mm -hmm. um, I went through and analyzed the WCAG 2.1 AA guidelines, and 28 out of 50 of them apply to screen reader users. Um, and so that's why people get the perception, and it's mostly people who are looking at it from the compliance point of view, because they're like, okay, mm -hmm. you know, we have to meet these 50 guidelines, and more than half of them are related to screen reader use, therefore it's all about screen reader use. Um, but if you look at the population numbers, right, the largest disability is actually colorblindness. Uh, four and a quarter percent of the population has colorblindness. Um, you know, more, when I, when I say the largest population, I mean the largest population that are currently addressed by the WCAG guidelines. We may have more people with dyslexia or more people who are neurodiverse, uh, but the, the guidelines uh, at 2.1 aren't covering those topics um, exhaustively yet. So, um, and there's five times as many people who use magnification as who use screen readers. So uh, magnification has two out of the 50 guidelines, but the population of people who need those two are much, much, much bigger. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, one of the things that, you know, maybe people are a little bit intimidated by accessibility. They, they, they kind of hear all these different ways in which people um, can interact with their product or service that they've never even thought about before. And they kind of think it's too hard and it's too difficult to, to think about. Um, and what advice would you have for those of us joining today who are just beginning to explore accessibility practices and you know, are, are wondering how it can enhance their teams and organization? What, what are some ways that they can learn more about all these different types of you know, disabilities that impact how someone might use their product and what they can do um, to improve the experience? Well, for starters, bring in people like me, right? The only way you're going to know how people with, with disabilities interact with data is to talk with people with disabilities and ask them how they interact with data. Um, you know, not all disabilities are the same. Uh, my daughter uh, is deaf, but she's congenitally deaf and she doesn't think of herself as disabled. And she's very well adapted her life because she's now 30 around all the things that she needs to do to accommodate her hearing loss. Somebody who woke up one morning who had uh, unimpaired hearing the night before and woke up with her level of hearing loss the next day, they would very definitely consider themselves disabled uh, because it's acquired and because they look at it psychologically as something that they had that they lost. So it's a very different perspective. And so it's critical to understand that you can have people with the exact same diagnosis or the exact same level of impairment and they do things with software completely differently. Uh, you know, uh, people with autism are famous uh, saying, if you've talked with one person with autism, you've talked with one person with autism. Uh, so bringing in, uh, you know, large groups of people with disabilities, uh, getting their input, um, a big one that doesn't seem so obvious is making sure your company has employee resource groups around disabilities, making sure that your DEI team considers disability as one of the dimensions of diversity. Uh, because even if you've got 20 people on your accessibility team, like VMware does, we're not in every room where every important conversation is, ha is happening. So having more employees with disabilities who are comfortable raising those issues in the room when the accessibility team isn't there is critical uh, to having more accessible products at the end of the day. Yeah, I, that's it's a really good point. And I think one of the, the things that, um, that we really need to do is to make sure that we're creating a really safe environment for people to disclose. It's a big deal um, to dis for someone to disclose that they have a, um, a disability in the workplace. And so that's kind of one of the opportunities that we have to- Yeah, psychological safety is absolutely critical. 
um, making sure that accommodations are available to everyone, uh, doing things as little as when somebody comes back from a health leave, say, hey, do you need an accommodation? You know, welcome back. We, we want you to be as productive as possible. What can we do to help you with that? Rather than making it this process where, oh, you have to go in and do this application and you have to be interviewed and you have to produce medical records, um, uh, which makes it very adversarial, uh, which, is, which is not the approach you want to take because that associates disability with negativity. And uh, disability is not a bad word. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, another kind of technique um, that I've used in the past is to really involve people with disabilities as part of your user research um, oh, kind definitely. of process. And what we're doing at Miro is trying to integrate accessibility right from the very start of our process. So even before the design phase, whenever we're coming up with requirements to think about what are the different needs. And I think it's really important to involve people with disabilities in the user research process right at that very early stage. Um, and I was wondering if that's something that you've um, tried or, or practiced yes, here. Yes, very, very much so. Um, I actually have a, a presentation uh, that I did uh, that's on a site called joinlearners.org about how to do user research with people with disabilities. It's mostly the same, uh, but there are some very important differences um, in terms of assistive technology and devices and the amount of time you allocate and how you run the sessions. Um, but it is critical uh, to get users with disabilities involved with user research. And there are organizations that specialize um, in recruiting those types of candidates uh, for you. So if, uh, you know, you might think that it would be difficult for example, uh, to find uh, people with certain tech skills who have glaucoma, but, but you know, Lighthouse for the Blind would help you with that uh, for a small amount of money. So um, I always recommend using those organizations that specialize in it um, because you will learn from them and they know how to do it. Yeah, um, absolutely. And um, what about staying up to date with the latest developments? I read one of your interesting um, articles or podcasts around technology always evolves faster than the ethics behind using that technology. And there's so many, there's VR um, that's up and coming. There's so many developments in technology. How is it possible to keep up to date with everything that's happening, you know, both from an accessibility point of view and how that impacts new technologies? So that's the part of the world where I feel like I'm banging my head against a brick wall sometimes. Um, you would think that somebody who is developing a new type of technology would look at the existing accessibility guidelines and go, hey, how can I make this work for people with disabilities? But they don't. Um, for example, there, there's a lawsuit right now uh, that was just uh, given the go ahead uh, that uh, about somebody who is suing because they, there was no captions in the VR and they were deaf uh, and they couldn't use it. So if you've got sound in your new technology, don't wait for somebody to mandate that that new technology be captioned. Just do it. Um, it's not rocket science. You do not want to exclude that huge chunk of your audience. And most importantly, if you're in the U.S. or you're selling to the U.S., you don't want to hang a target on your chest that says, uh, go ahead and sue me because I've got sound and I've got no captions. Um, the two that I, so VR and XR, they're getting there. The two that really concern me right now are Web3 and blockchain, uh, because there are no accessible blockchain uh, user interfaces right now. Ethereum was supposed to do one, and then they didn't. Um, so as those two things get more and more adopted and more developed and more integrated into how we do things you know for example we start using blockchain for voting if we don't have an accessible blockchain interface we're excluding people from with disabilities from participating in the voting process that's terrible it's also unconstitutional um, web3 is even worse because it with blockchain you can at least point to individual companies and say, hey, it's your user interface, you need to fix it. Web3 is so distributed, I'm not sure at the end of the day we're going to know who to point to and say, you have to fix the UI. Um, so that is of significant concern to me. Um, and I'm trying to kind of 
you know, shout that from the rooftops uh, so that it gets the attention that it deserves. It's always easier and cheaper to build in accessibility from the beginning than it is to try to jam it on at the end. Yeah, that's an, such an important concept. We want to kind of shift left the kind of awareness and, you know, knowledge about accessibility as early, you know, in the process as possible. And, and hopefully over time, as we start to see these new technologies, like hopefully accessibility will be addressed much earlier um, in the process so we don't have this, you know, kind of um, evolution of technology that's much faster than accessibility. So Very early in my software testing career, um, my mentor, uh, said that the cheapest bug to fix is the one that never got introduced. Um, you know, that is the ultimate outcome of shift left. Uh, it's not just identifying issues early and fixing them when it's cheaper, it's preventing the issues from happening in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. So Sherry, thank you so much um, for joining us today and for sharing your experience, wisdom, and insight with it. Is there anything you want to, any closing thoughts you want to leave with us before we wrap up? Um, I have written a book uh, that is available for free. You can download it from accessibility.uxdesign.cc. Um, and it provides a lot of really practical advice on how to deal with objections to accessibility. So I think if you're new and just getting started, um, that that's, that's a good thing uh, to, to review, to understand uh, some of the objections that you might uh, see and hear and how to overcome them. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, we'll provide a link to that um, in our resources after after the presentation. So yeah, thank you again. And it's it's really this kind of collaboration and sharing ideas that helps us all continue to make progress um, from an accessibility perspective. And so we're really happy to have this partnership and collaboration with VMware. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.